carries it is both a force multiplier, it gives the maritime commander the assets he needs to dominate in the air, surface and subsurface environment to achieve environmental control, but of course it's also a power projection tool that allows penetration inland and to strike at centers of gravity away from the ocean. And of course, it is a symbol of maritime power and of deterrence. And on deterrence, I should of course recognize with the first sea lord here, a nuclear submariner. There are other forms of deterrence, but they tend to be sort of black and sneaky and somewhat unseen. The aircraft carrier is the opposite of the spectrum. It's brash, it's in your face, it's big, and it's effective, it's visible and working. And on the subject of first sea lords and deterrence, I would just like to venture into a little historical uh, escape. I'm nervous with so many eminent historians around. But about 100 years ago, the Navy had, a, or my Navy, had another first sea lord uh, called Sir Jackie Fisher. He was quite a character. And he was responsible largely for generating the readiness of the Royal Navy for the First World War. And he has a connection with the deterrence. I'll come on to in a minute. But uh, Sir Jackie Fisher was a, a very interesting man. Uh, he was not shy. Um, he and Churchill had an interesting relationship, uh, basically shaped by the fact that the United Kingdom was not big enough for two such eagerness, so they kept bouncing off one another. But he was accused at uh, the Hague conference as he prepared for war of being a warmonger. And Jackie Fisher rather famously said, I'm, I'm not for war, I'm for peace. But if you let it be known that you are ready at a moment's notice to set about your enemy with all your might, to strike the first blow, to kick him in the belly when he is down, to slaughter his women and children, and burn his prisoners in oil, should you choose to take any, then people tend to stay away from you. And I suppose they would. <laughs> the concept of deterrence has not changed much, but I suspect that tonight, when the first sea lord speaks, he might present it in a slightly better politically nuanced way a hundred years later. But Jackie Fisher is interesting because he was known as, he's always known as the father of the dreadnought battleship, as a technology that was hugely effective in the First World War, but it did not endure. The battleship was replaced uh, as a, the element of maritime power by the aircraft carrier. As an interesting nuance, uh, Jackie Fisher's uh, dreadnoughts were built in Portsmouth, many of them, and the, the, dock, or the, sorry, the dry docks that were built to give birth to the battleships, the scrapings, were taken to a place called Whale Island, which was a little spit in Portsmouth Harbour, and dumped there. While Ireland was then populated initially by, as a zoo, by, air, by animals that returning ships brought from around the world. And it was there that naval aviation was born in about 1907, 1908. And as the Admiralty experimented with, I said, originally kites and hot air balloons, it was interesting that it was Jackie Fisher who provided the imperative's first sea lord for the Admiralty to buy its first uh, air ship, the Mayfly and thereby, having created the dreadnoughts, he also not only provided the political impetus, he provided the land from the dry docks that gave birth to the technology that replaced the dreadnoughts, the aircraft carrier. So aircraft carriers are significant, and they're emotional. For us in smaller navies in Europe, aircraft carriers since the Second World War, you've heard from Dr. Gosh uh, in India, they are not just a visible brass representation of maritime power, they sit across that boundary between a cost of operations between land-based air power and sea-based air power and reducing forces that causes friction and if you want to see friction you look at the UK defense policy since the 1960s and carriers in procurement are always a deeply emotional issue. <coughs> However, there were some slides, I forgot about those. But the, the carrier represents a proven utility. And the UK carrier intention has always been to replace our invincible class carriers. The context is shown there. Early in the crisis, when host nation support and basing or overall flight pollution cannot be guaranteed, maritime forces will be the principal means by which political and diplomatic influence, and if necessary, decisive force, can be applied. I've included there the caveat at the end, at acceptable risk. And following on what Admiral Madison said, that term now is very contemporary at acceptable risk. And we look at the lessons that have been learned from engagements uh, in the Middle East over the last decades, we're seeing again a political sensitivity 
to what is acceptable risk in intervention operations, which again refreshes the utility of maritime power. But additionally, in the UK, we want the maximum utility from the carrier. We want this joint strike asset effectively to do everything. Um, I leave that up there with some what can be buzzwords, but these are significant. Because in a time of um, shrinking defence budgets, and I'll come on to deployments later on, why these were important in a joint procurement environment. These characteristics are sometimes taken for granted, and you can't take them for granted in maritime aviation, and I'll come on to that later. So we've specifically mandated this, not for our information, but across the joint procurement process, when people are procuring other equipments, we've all seen it in ISTAR, but actually in aviation equipments, we need to take account of the interoperability that's required to operate from a maritime platform. This slide indicates the breadth um, of what we aspire to do. There's a lot on it, but all I will say is on the left of that diagram, the things that we do routinely, and if you look in the middle there, peace enforcement and all of those, the two attributes of a maritime platform that provide utility in those areas, the areas that we do most often, are actually people and volume. And it's interesting in modern procurement where we try to control costs by making platforms smaller and reducing crew sizes, actually what we're in danger of doing is reducing the utility of our platforms. And so there is a crossover point there which we're all struggling to meet, and we see that in our current carrier development. The technical solution for our carrier remains centered around the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, you will all know that we have been with the F-35B Stovall for um, nearly 20 years now. Uh, there was a brief interlude when the new government came in and we aspired for the uh, F-35C, and you will know we've gone back now to the F-35B. Uh, there are distinct advantages which were recognised to the C. <coughs> I think when the government came in, the technical challenges of achieving that, given where we were in the build programme at that time, uh, made their aspiration difficult, and that's why we've had a, a rethink of where we are and gone back to the B, and I can explain later why that was. Along with the aircraft to give us the, with the F-35 aircraft, to give us the flexibility we start, the Merlin Mark II helicopter currently being upgraded, and into that platform we will incorporate the airborne surveillance and aircraft and control capability that's currently deployed in our seeking Mark 7s in Afghanistan. And that technology will be, become a role equipment to be fitted into the maritime uh, he Merlin helicopter, which will become both an ASW and ASAC platform. But we also want to use the aircraft carrier for a variety of other aircraft of all different types. And this <coughs> reflects what we've experienced over 40 years, but actually increasingly in the last decade, of using platforms to provide spots for maritime aviation at sea. And therefore, we're driving very hard to make sure that as many aircraft as possible can be operated from these carriers. But I'll talk in training some of the problems about this. The ship itself is significantly larger than the Invincible class, as shown on this slide. The size was driven by various factors, but predominantly the need for a weight of effort of strike aircraft to deliver the required effect on target. Our concept phase studies indicated the ship needed to deliver over 100 sorties per day, in fact up to 140 in some scenarios. And this output was also profiled to identify peaks of demand on the deck cycle and the ability to retain aircraft at low load status. All of this work identified numerous pinch points in the deck handling arrangements, and these became the driver for the width of the flight deck, while the length of the ship was largely dictated by the takeoff run required for the Stovall aircraft at full or weight. Of course, the dimensions were also, to some extent, determined by the need of that time to have a design that could be either Stovall or Cats and Traps, uh, because we had not yet finalised the Joint Strike Fighter variant we were going for. We couldn't, because at the time, the technology risk on the Stovall was rated at very high, and there was no fallback position. So the ship had to be able to accommodate a fallback to catapults and arrest again. So the Queen Elizabeth was designed at 65,000 tonnes, um, 280 metres in length, 70 metre beam, and a flight deck of some four acres. 
The novel to island design has attracted much comment and widespread scepticism, including from me. And intuitively, it looks wrong. All I can say is I actually was the desk officer in the 98 Defence Review and wrote the profiles that drove <coughs> the requirement. And against our intuitive uh, impression, the modelling demonstrated that for the profiles, this strange arrangement uh, is the most efficient way of delivering the 136 sorties. And I'm afraid in a nation when you're constrained by financial resources, the empirical data of a mathematical model outweighs the scepticism of old people like me. The technical opportunities were significant. The, we thought at the time that the Queen Elizabeth might be the world's first all-electric aircraft carrier. We had already decided it would not be nuclear powered. The limitation on that was not the cost of the power plants in the ship, it was the cost of adapting the nuclear infrastructure in the UK to accommodate a ship of 65,000 tonnes would require new nuclear berths, and that is a huge infrastructure cost. And it was decided then that the main propulsion would be electric to provide commonality with our Type 45 destroyers and our um, Type 23 frigates. But in an aircraft carrier, electric power also offered two significant advantages. It allowed us to move the prime mover gas turbines away from the main line propulsion shafts. Um, in the Invincible class, the main engines are connected to the propellers by massive, over 110 tonne gearboxes <coughs> and hugely long main shafts, which over their life brought their own engineering and maintenance problems. However, most importantly for a carrier, the dislocating the engine from the drivetrain allows us to rid ourselves of the requirement to shift huge volumes of air down into the bowels of the ship onto the power line to feed the gas turbines and then take the exhaust up. The net effect of which is, um, sorry, wrong slide. The net effect of which is, it's shown in here, the clear American deck. In the UK CVS, the width of the deck is halved by the need for the uptakes and downtakes to take air down to the gas turbines and remove the exhaust up. And that reduces the width of your hangar by a third. So by going for an all electric ship, we were able to shift the propulsion system to put the prime movers up on the upper decks near to the air and put the generators and power things down next to the shafts, thereby not impeding in the hangar. The other advantage was if we went to caps and traps, we needed a power source to drive the catapults. And in the history of carriers, uh, no one has ever in, uh, operated a steam catapult when the ship was not powered by steam, either oil-fired or nuclear-fired, uh, to prevent the steam that. So if we were going to have catapults, steam catapults, we were going to have to have an independent steam generation capability just separate to the propulsion system. And that proved, at the time of the government's decision to change, a significant engineering constraint at that stage of the build process. So, we wanted electric. We also wanted to reduce manpower. And one of our biggest manpower drivers in the studies was weapon handling. As we all know, carriers, it buys up a lot of people, if they're flying a lot of sources, to arm weapons and move them around. We looked at people like DHL and some of our UK supermarkets for how they did it. And their systems were highly developed, but of course, what we didn't know was would it work at sea. So we built many test rigs to test these systems at sea to ensure that actually we could reduce the manpower uh, and still do our weapon handling. We've heard again from Admiral Madison the constraints on shipbuilding and the need to maintain that industry. The carrier requirement was larger than any single yard um, could provide. It's the biggest warship the UK has ever built in history. Uh, and therefore, it was um, split across uh, six yards in the UK, all to be assembled um, in one place uh, up in Rosyth, with the big, only dock big enough in the UK to take the carrier. That has been a huge success, and the blocks have gone up, and it's actually a huge engineering feat to watch how this all takes place, as these massive super blocks, of uh, tens of thousands of tons, come together having been transported from all around the UK. And the ship now has actually had the superstructure put on and actually finally begins to look properly like an aircraft carrier. <coughs> but moving on to training, 
The dilemma that we face at the moment is, of course, we have paid off our carrier fixed wing capability, and we have a 10 year gap uh, before we bring these into service. And that presents a dilemma in preserving the skills that we need. HMS Illustrious and HMS Ocean are continuing to operate helicopters, and they will sustain some elements of the necessary experience set. And indeed, HMS Ocean and also the French task group operating nearby both recently demonstrated the ability of carriers to react to arising events. The French carrier, the Charles de Gaulle, had just returned from a six month uh, deployment to the Indian Ocean and was in Toulon uh, and was then actually sailed at very short notice because of Libya, where she joined with Ocean, who was actually en route to an amphibious task group exercise uh, also in the Indian Ocean. And both of those ships demonstrated again the flexibility of maritime air power from carriers in reacting, as did the US carriers, and people forget that many of the first day strikes, if not all of them, came from sea in that scenario. The sustainment came from land. During that deployment, um, we operated the a range of Apache aircraft from the ship. Now, I will stress <coughs> this, that people take for granted when we put these nice shiny things of carriers with four acres of flight deck, and people underestimate the difficulties of operating from sea. Too often, well, often we get it wrong, and the hazards of operating from decks are underestimated, and the consequences are fairly dramatic and unpleasant, as warships and task groups provide their own hazards in terms of high power transmissions, the operating environment, and the effect of wind and movement across a deck. The Apache is a good example that although we operated these aircraft effectively off Libya, what people do not appreciate that while you're operating them, because of their undercarriage characteristics and the fact that the rotor head hasn't got restrictions on its flapping hinges, the ship is constrained to within about 5 to 10 degrees and, and also in speed. So although we want to do as much as we can with the ships, unless aircraft are marinized properly, you cannot operate them flexibly at sea because they present a huge constraint to the maneuverability of the platform itself. And it's a message that we are fighting because people think four acres, you can do a lot with it, but it's more than just a tank measure. In the case of the um, Apache embarkation, although people said it demonstrated the utility of power, it did. That embarkation had been planned and practiced for 15 years, and the squadron in the Army Air Corps that embarked had been nominated in a memorandum of understanding signed 15 years previously as the maritime dedicated squadron, and a third of the pilots that embarked were actually Navy pilots uh, as part of that squadron to make sure we had the maritime expertise. So, at the moment, the training um, of our people is being done in concert with allies in uh, the United States, uh, and in France, where we have over 250 people who will be going on non-reciprocal exchanges to make sure that we keep the skills going that will allow us to operate these flight decks in 2018. So, in summary, the UK Queen Elizabeth Carrier Programme is on track to provide a new UK carrier capability consisting of the Queen Elizabeth class itself, the F-35B and the new Merlin Airborne C-2 aircraft. The engineering has already been an exciting success, and the thrust now with our allies is to ensure that the manpower is available at the right time, 2018, and the right level training to take the new ships and aircraft to sea as soon as possible. Thank you very much.